This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 15th chapter of Job, verse 31. We are in the discourse of Eliphaz, who has accused Job again of being a hypocrite, of coming to trust in all of the vast possessions that he had and so God had stripped him of those things according to the uh, philosophy of Eliphaz and allowed him to become so desolate. In his speech against Job, verse 31, he said to Job, let not him that is deceived trust in vanity, for vanity shall be his recompense or reward. Eliphaz realized that life is filled with deception. It is interesting that over and over in the Bible we are warned about being deceived. Those warnings are not in vain because Satan is the master deceiver. And when you get to the book of Revelation, he is actually called the deceiver. And how he has deceived so many. And Satan's Deception goes back to the very beginning of man. In the Garden of Eden, God had said to man that he could freely eat of all of the trees in the garden except the tree that was in the midst of the garden. And God warned him that the day that he ate of that tree, he would surely die. Now, Paul tells us in the New Testament that Satan deceived Eve. He came into the garden and he said to her, Did God say that you can eat of all of the trees that are in the garden? And she responded, Yes, except the tree in the middle. God told us if we ate of that, we would surely die. And Satan said, Oh, you won't really die. God is not really being fair to you. God is holding back from you that which is pleasurable, that which is desirable. God knows that in the day that you eat of that tree, you will become like God because you will be able to know between good and evil. And with this deception. Eve actually thought that she could eat of that tree and not suffer the consequences. She thought that God was not being fair with her. God, by his laws, was restricting her fun that God was holding back from her something that was very desirable. And she thought that she could go ahead and eat without suffering the consequences. Deceived, Eve ate. And to her sorrow, found that if you are deceived and you trust in emptiness, then emptiness becomes your reward. And Eve entered into that emptiness of a life that is separated from God. Satan deceives people today. He uses the same line. 
He would try to convince you that God's laws are not really fair. Or that God's laws don't apply to you. That you somehow are a special case. And that God, by his laws, is just placed restrictions upon you that are holding you back from that which is desirable, that which is pleasurable, that which would bring you so much fulfillment and so much joy. That somehow God isn't fair in the things that he has said and that you can go ahead and transgress the law of God, you won't die. You can do it and somehow maintain a relationship with God. You can follow after emptiness without becoming empty. But even as Eve was deceived and to her own sorrow found out that she had made a serious mistake, so men today discover that they've been deceived and that God is not mocked. And whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. In the book of the law, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, God said that a man should not lie with mankind as he would with a woman. And that if a man should do that, he should surely be put to death. Satan came along and he said, you're different. That law doesn't really apply to you. You were born differently from others. And that you can go ahead and practice homosexuality. You won't be affected. It doesn't really apply. God is just trying to keep you back from something which for you is desirable and would bring you pleasure. You can do it. You won't die. And the homosexual community learned that by lobbying they could influence our laws and change our laws. But the thing is, they could not influence or change the laws of God. By their parading and coming out of the closet, so to speak, they found that they could change man's acceptance of their chosen lifestyles. But though they might change man's acceptance, they don't change God's acceptance. And to their dismay, they are coming to understand that when a person is deceived by Satan and follows after emptiness, then emptiness becomes his reward. Satan lied and said, you surely will not die. But thousands of them are now dying as the result of their disobedience to the law of God. The Bible warns us not to be deceived. Over and over that warning comes. Be not deceived, Paul wrote, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God has created that as a law of nature. God has placed within every seed a genetic code. And that genetic code allows that seed to reproduce after its own kind. It's the law of nature. Think of how chaotic farming would be if that were not so. You go out and sow the wheat seed in your field. And up would come cantaloupe, spinach, 
broccoli, asparagus, kiwi. (laughs) But God placed in every seed the code for the reproduction of itself. So whatsoever a man sows, that he also reaps. It's, It's the law of nature. We understand it. It is also true in the spiritual realm. It is a spiritual law as well as a natural law. The spiritual law is the same. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And if you sow to the flesh, then you will reap of the flesh corruption. If you sow to the spirit, then of the spirit you will reap life and joy and peace. The mind of man is a fertile field in which you are planting seeds each day. If you are planting into your mind those seeds of the flesh, if you are planting into your mind pornography through magazines, videos, movies, if you are planting into your mind these things that are pornographic, those things planted in your mind will begin to reap fruit, bring forth corrupt fruit out of your life. Garbage in, garbage out. And you'll find that your mind will begin to be preoccupied with sex and various kinds of sex and all the things that you've seen you begin to fantasize for yourself you've sown to the flesh and of the flesh you will begin to reap corruption if you sow into your mind the music with its suggestive lyrics. You'll find that as you're going down the street without realizing it, you'll be humming a tune. And suddenly you'll think of the lyrics of that tune and it's, you know, a, a, something that is very suggestive or how I desire to have, you know, you or some relationship with you or whatever. And, and these things planted in your mind begin to produce an attitude, an an action from the flesh. If you are sowing into your mind the TV soapbox cereals and you're watching, you know, as all of these affairs are going on, the husband is supposed to be at work, but really he's out playing around and messing around and all, uh, it, it begins to breed in your mind all of these suspicions, all of these jealousies, all of these doubts, and and it begins to disrupt your whole marriage because this trust upon which marriage must be based is, is broken because you now suspicion that he's doing those things. And if he gets home late, you go over and smell his coat to see if there's perfume and you're ready, you know, to just really go to it, you know, because you've planted all this stuff in your mind and you begin to... Imagine that that's what's taking place. If you plant into your mind the Word of God, you're sowing to the Spirit. And of the Spirit, you'll begin to reap. You'll begin to think about God. You'll become more conscious of him in the creation around you. You'll begin to to see the handiwork, the design, and you begin to marvel and be amazed at God's creative genius. You begin to stand sort of in awe and wonder of him. You see him manifested in so many different ways. If you are planting into your mind The music. The Bible says uh, that we should be occupied with psalms and 
hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Well, if you're planting into your mind good music, spiritual music, music that exalts and edifies Jesus Christ, then as you're going along the street, you'll find yourself humming and, and you'll think of the words, I love you, Lord, and I lift my... Oh, all right, you know, and, and you reap of the Spirit. You see, that's just the way life is. Of course, even today, I think that it's more important probably than ever to watch what goes into our minds. Because what goes in is going to have its effect upon me. What I sow, I'm going to also reap. Don't be deceived. You cannot be sowing all day long to the flesh and expect to reap a spiritual harvest. It doesn't happen. Don't be deceived. If you trust in emptiness, then emptiness will be the result. When I was a kid, of course, the songs weren't nearly as, the lyrics weren't nearly as, in, as horrible as they are. They were rather innocuous, you know, but yet I know how it goes. You start whistling, you know, and, and you're whistling Mersey Dotes and Dozy Dotes and Little Amsy Livy, you know. <laughs> Killy Ivy too, wouldn't you? And, I mean, it, you know, there's nothing that's so sensuous or <laughs> suggestive about that. Down in a meadow in an itsy bitsy pool swam three little fishy <laughs> and a mommy fishy too, you know. <laughs> boop boop did him, dot him, one him too. I mean, it doesn't really corrupt you. I don't know that it does you any good, but it, it's not corrupting. I look at some of the lyrics of the songs today and it's absolutely corrupting. Absolutely corrupting. And you can't plant that stuff in without being corrupted by it. That's, that's the mistake that people make. I can do it, but it won't affect me. I can do it, it won't be a part of me. But you cannot, you cannot plant that into your mind without it having its effect upon you. That is why it is so important to put a guard, a filter over your mind and only sow that which will edify, that which is spiritual if you sow to the Spirit. But as parents, you are responsible to put the guard over your children's minds. And you need to be very concerned with what your kids are watching on TV. You need to be very concerned with the music that they are listening to. It isn't wise to just say, go to your bedroom and listen to your records, you know. You better find out what those records are saying to them. Because if they sow to the flesh, they're going to reap of the flesh corruption. We had certain rules within the home as our children were growing up. We had no problems with our girls. Our boys were different. <laughs> and they were always pressing to bend the rules. It was, oh, Dad, you know. And I was accused of being old-fashioned, old fogey, the whole bit. Because I insisted that they weren't going to listen to the trashy music in my house. And I said, look, as long as I am paying the light bills, as long as I am paying the rent, as long as I'm buying the food that's on the table and you're eating, the food that I bought <laughs> and using the electricity that I pay the bill for. You're going to abide by the laws of the house. And the day you feel you don't have to abide by the laws of the house, then you can start paying your own light bill 
and your own rent because you're out. And I believe that parents have to put the filter upon what their children are listening to. Because your children are susceptible and are just as easily deceived as you are by the lies of Satan. And by allowing them to fill their minds with the corruption, it is going to produce that same corruption in their lives. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. In the law, God said to the children of Israel, to not let their hearts be deceived so that they would turn away from him and begin to serve other gods. Another lie of Satan that has deceived many people today is that lie that it really doesn't matter which road you take, all roads lead to God. You ever heard that lie? It's one that Satan is constantly using. He is saying, look, it really doesn't matter what you believe, just believe in something. It really doesn't matter what religion you follow, just be religious. And it is a deception of Satan to bring comfort to a person on the road to hell. Be not deceived. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it, but broad is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And Satan is always trying to broaden the way and broaden the gate and invite people to come through. It really doesn't matter, he says, what you believe. But it does matter what you believe. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. And there are ways that may seem right to men, but the end of them is death. And if you are deceived into believing an empty vanity, a lie of Satan, then emptiness becomes your reward. Here Eliphaz said to Job, let not him who is deceived trust in emptiness or in vanity. There are many things that people have come to trust in today. Empty things into which people have placed their trust. And right off the top of my head comes one of the things that empty things that people are trusting in are the promises of politicians. That happens to just come into my mind for some reason, just right off the top. <laughs> oh, I'll be glad when Wednesday comes. Can you believe no, you can't. I mean, hope you don't. I hope you're not deceived. But all of the things that they are saying, you know, I mean, it's just... Jeremiah wrote to the people in the rock city of Petra. The rock city of Petra was a, a fascinating city carved right out of the rock. Their, their temples and their, their homes and all were carved right out of this sandstone rock. But to get to the rock city of Petra, you have to go through this valley that gets so narrow that at points it's no wider than the pulpit. And sheer cliffs, and you just make your way in this narrow, narrow gorge. So that it was easy to defend the city of Petra. Because they lived in rock houses, car houses carved out of the rock, but to get there, 
you had to go, the armies would have to come single file. So all you had to do is block up this narrow gorge and, and you could stop the armies uh, from invading. And, and thus the people in Petra felt that there was no way that they could ever be conquered. They trusted in the fact that they were living in a place that was secure. From a military standpoint, it was impregnable. And so Jeremiah said, don't be deceived. Thinking that you are impregnable. You're going to fall. You've been lifted up with pride because of your power and might. But you're going to come down. You've trusted in emptiness. The emptiness of military security. There are many people who are trusting in the emptiness of the works of their own hands. They are seeking by their works to be justified before God. They are pointing to their works as their card of acceptance. Wanting God to accept them for the things that they have done for God. I give to the United Way. I don't do to people what I wouldn't want them to do to me. I, you know, return wallets that I find. I help little ladies across the street. And, and thus... I want somehow by my works to be accepted by God. And they look many times to the works of their hands for fulfillment, even for themselves. Solomon, in the text that we read this morning, talked about how he gave himself to building these great monuments. He built the temple in Jerusalem. He built these marvelous irrigation systems to water the orchards and all that he had made. And after looking at all of these tremendous monuments that he had built, all, he, he left his trademark all over town. He said when he looked at it all, it was just empty. It left him with a feeling of emptiness. If you trust in emptiness, emptiness will be your reward. There are people who are looking for meaningful relationships in the party life. They even advertise on their cars, you know, that they're party animals. Um, and their whole life, you know, looking for the party, looking for the action. And hoping and trusting that somewhere, somehow, they're going to find fulfillment, meaningful relationship, satisfaction. But don't be deceived. If you trust in emptiness, emptiness will be your reward. People trust in their wealth for their security. And they think that somehow wealth will bring them satisfaction. Solomon wrote, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase, because this also is empty. The question that should be asked at this point is, what are you trusting in? For your salvation and your acceptance by God. You're hoping to be saved. You're hoping that God will accept you. What is the basis for your hope? On what are you trusting in? This morning, are you trusting in your good works? 
What vanity. What emptiness. Because you have to go behind and look at what motivated your work. Why did you give? so that you would be recognized and acknowledged by the community as a generous, benevolent person? What if they had not put your picture in the paper? Would you still have given as much? What if no one had known about it? Would you have still done it? Are you trusting in the fact that you're very religious? Oh, how many people have been deceived and are trusting in this emptiness. The emptiness of being religious. You know, I believe probably some of the most religious people in the United States today, some of the most sincerely religious, some of the most devoted, devotedly religious people are the saintness that are offering children as human sacrifices in their satanic rites. I mean, that takes a real degree of commitment. Women who will deliberately bear children for the purpose of offering them as a sacrifice to Satan. You talk about being religious. Man, that is heavy-duty religion. But should God accept them because they're religious? When they stand before God, can they say, Well, Lord, surely you will receive me because look how devoted I was. And after all, all roads lead to you. Not so. Being religious won't buy you anything. God doesn't really require a person to be religious. In fact, I think he rather is upset with religion. He wants a relationship with you. And in order that you might have a true relationship with God, he provided for your sins through his son, Jesus Christ. And it isn't religion, it's relation that God is seeking. If you're trusting in emptiness, emptiness will be your reward. We dare not trust in anything other than Jesus Christ as a hope for our acceptance before God. I have put my hope in him. I have no alternate plan. I have no contingency plans. If he fails, I'm, I'm done. I have no hope. But my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. He is the basis of my hope for eternal life. Eliphaz said to Job, if you are deceived and you trust in emptiness, then emptiness will be your reward. <laughs> it, it sort of mathematically figures out nothing plus nothing equals nothing. And if you're trusting in nothing or emptiness, vanity, then the result will be emptiness or vanity. Don't be deceived into thinking that you can buy your way into the grace of God. Don't be deceived into thinking that you can talk your way into the kingdom of heaven. But take a very careful inventory of your own life. The Bible said if we will judge ourselves, we will not be judged of God. Look at what you are trusting in today as your hope for salvation and eternal life. And then I would encourage you to set your feet upon the solid rock, even Jesus Christ, 
and put your trust and your hope in him. For he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. You can believe in that. You can put your hope in that. Your faith in that. Your confidence in that. Shall we pray? Lord, as we see how strong is the deception of Satan and growing stronger every day, as those who did not have a love for the truth are given up by you and you allow them to believe the lie of Satan rather than the truth. And you allow this strong delusion and deception to overcome them. Oh God, we pray that you will give to us a love for your truth, a love for your Son, who is the truth, a love for your word, which is true. And may we begin to hide your word away in our hearts. May we begin to plant your word in the fertile soil of our own minds. May we begin, Lord, to sow to the Spirit that we of the Spirit might reap eternal life through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Again, I would encourage you to take a deep look inside and discover what is the basis of your hope to stand before God? What is the basis of your hope for eternal life? If you're hoping in a church, then you've been deceived into trusting in vanity because the church can't save you. If you're hoping in a creed, creeds can't save you. Salvation comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Believing in him. And the sacrifice that he made for our sins. There is substance there upon which you can put your trust. If you haven't yet received Jesus Christ as your Savior, then really, as Paul said, you are without hope, without Christ, and without God in this world. But you don't have to be there. You can receive him even now in your heart. You can just say, Lord, I accept, I receive. And you can choose to follow Jesus now. It's just that simple. It's a change of heart, repentance, determining I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to believe in him. You might want to sort of solidify that commitment and go back to the prayer room and meet with the pastors and allow them to pray with you and to pray for you. Now may the Lord be with you and may his hand be upon you to guide you this week. May you experience his presence, his power. And as you sow to the Spirit, may you reap life and joy and peace in Jesus' name.